Good afternoon, good morning all. Um, thank you for joining this event. Um, my name is Harry Lee. I'm a social development advisor in the FCDO social protection team, um, which funds space. And I'm gonna welcome you to this event on the uh, economics of early response and resilience to COVID-19 in Ethiopia uh, on behalf of the FCDO social protection team and space. Really looking forward to this session. Um, thank you to sp.org for hosting. Um, I'm just gonna say a few words of, by introduction, something brief on space for those of you who, who don't know the service and then a bit of background to this paper that we're launching today. Um, <clears throat> so introduction to space. Um, it's the Social Protection Approaches to COVID Expert Helpline. Uh, it's a service that's open to governments, donors, implementing partners. Um, and to help them think through how to maintain or adapt existing systems and programs to meet rapidly growing needs that we've seen under COVID-19. Uh, it's an FCDO, GIZ, DFAT collaboration. Um, and FCDO is really proud of what space has achieved so far. So since it was launched early on in the, in the pandemic. Uh, so to date, it's engaged with over 40 countries through more than 90 engagements, supported over uh, 30 organizations to respond to, to COVID-19. Um, there's also an evolving suite of knowledge products, uh, so 26 published published papers and eight blogs. So I hope you'll check some of those out if you haven't already. Um, just a couple of things on the background to this event. So it's a chance to discuss findings from the space paper on the economics of early response and resilience to COVID-19 in Ethiopia. Um, the paper itself combines micro simulation analysis carried out through space to give us a, a detailed picture of needs, gaps and coverage in conflict affected countries during the COVID-19 pandemic, so including Ethiopia. Uh, but then in combination with findings from the seminal economics of response studies, which were carried out for what was then DFID and then USAID um, in 2013, 2018. Um, but the aim of this paper is to really take the <clears throat> analysis a step further um, into a costed exercise. So how much did routine delivery of social protection and humanitarian assistance save and aid costs when COVID hit? Um, and I think the findings are pretty persuasive. Uh, the link to the paper should be in the chat um, for you to read after the webinar. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from Courtney about her work and from our panelists. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to Fergus McBean from FCDO Ethiopia, who's gonna moderate this session. Uh, Fergus is the head of climate and energy Ethiopia and African Union at, at the Brit British Embassy in Addis Ababa and before this spent most almost 20 years responding to humanitarian emergencies around the world. Over to you Fergus. Great, thank you very much Harry um, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm really looking forward to this uh, virtual discussion. It's a subject that's very close to my heart um, uh, as have in responding to emergencies and, and now looking at uh, the case for, for ways in which we can do things better. Um, it's said to be a fascinating one with folks that have been looking into these subjects for the last decade and it's my privilege to in introduce them. Uh, so first up is Courtney Cavinton. She's the author of the report. She's currently the deputy team leader of the Space Initiative. Um, it is an economist and as we'll see, has extensive social protection experience, including value for money and cost benefit analysis of early action and different shock responsive strategies. Courtney um, is the author of the report and we'll, um, we'll hear about um, uh, the, the economics of early response and resilience to, uh, to COVID-19. Um, uh, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed her previous reports um, uh, that date back to 2013, and so this is this is said to be a, another great, a great read and informative uh, read. Um, we will then, um, after Courtney uh, presents, we will then hear from Stefan Durkin, um, who's a professor of economic policy at the University of Oxford. He's also director of the Centre for the Study of African Economies and the Development Policy Advisor to the Foreign Secretary at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Between 2011 and 2017, he was the Chief Economist of the Department for International Development and his research interests mainly concern what keeps some people uh, and countries poor and how to organize and finance responses to natural disasters and protracted humanitarian crises. Uh, next up we'll hear from Greg Collins who serves as a Deputy Assistant Administrator in the USA Bureau for Resilience and Food Security uh, which leads the US government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative. 
Feed the Future. In this role, he oversees the strategic direction and implementation of Feed the Future program in the field and the initiatives, uh, agriculture research and policy efforts, and the USAID Center for Resilience. Greg also serves as the agency's resilience coordinator. He is a recognized global thought leader and resilience, uh, has, on resilience and has played a lead role in developing and operationalizing a strategic vision for resilience at USAID. Um, so as I said, I will first hand over to Courtney, uh, who will give the presentation, and then uh, we'll hear from reflections from Stefan Durkin and Greg Collins. Um, the, the purpose then will be to, to um, engage all of you in, in questions. So please uh, keep those questions coming. The way you can do that is via Slido. Um, the link will be posted in uh, the chat right now. Um, and, and what we'll do is we'll try to keep this as engaging as possible, um, but bearing in mind that uh, the number of of you that are going to be showing interest in this, we'll try to do our best to, to make sure that the, the most popular questions, so you can like questions that you want to hear answers to, um, are answered um, and, uh, and, and the, the help stimulate the discussion. So I'll now hand over to Courtney, who will go run through the presentation. Um, and uh, as I say, uh, this, is a, this is a great piece of work and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Over. Thank you so much, Fergus. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and thanks to all of you for, for attending and to Stefan and Greg um, for joining us today as well. It means a lot. Um, I also just want to call out that this work uh, really has over the years been a very collaborative effort across a, a number of consultants and I won't name them all now, but the work that I'm going to present today um, the economics of early response and resilience study, um, whilst I was in charge of kind of leading on it and turning it into an economic model, uh, it relies very heavily on the work of Food Economy Group and their HEA work, um, particularly Tanya Boudreau and Mark Lawrence. And then um, the second um, piece, the way that we sort of extended this under space, uh, relied heavily on micro simulations um, work that Emily Wild on the space team did, who's on the call today. So she also can help if there are any questions that are more technical around that piece. And then just a raft of local consultants in the three countries, as well as international consultants who helped to support this work. So I just want to call out that this is very much a joint effort. Um, and uh, many thanks to Tim Waits and Sophie Pongratz, who initiated this work back in 2013, and then Greg who um, commissioned us to take it forward in 2018. So I am going to walk you through, sorry, this has started in the wrong spot. I'm gonna walk you through um, this, this paper that we did a few months ago, looking at the economics of response to COVID-19. The aim of the project was to, of the research, was to estimate the economic impact of safety nets and humanitarian response to the COVID-19 crisis in Ethiopia. Um, we picked Ethiopia because uh, the economics of early response and resilience study had, we had originally done that work in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia with very detailed models over 15 years. Um, and when Emily did the micro simulation models, uh, one of the countries where she was able to do a deeper dive was for Ethiopia. So we saw real opportunity to try and understand what can we infer from the economics of early response and resilience studies by combining that with our understanding of how things have changed under COVID. Um, Ethiopia is also home to one of the largest national safety net programs, the Productive Safety Net Programming, be benefiting over 8 million people. So it's a very um, prime context to try to understand these issues. Uh, as I mentioned, we really were doing a mashup of these two studies. So um, combining the economics of early, and re early response and resilience studies, which used household economy approach, to estimate cost savings due to alternative response scenarios and combining that with these new micro simulations undertaken by SPACE and FCDO to estimate the change in the number of people falling below the poverty line as a result of COVID-19. And by combining the two, helping us to estimate the economic impact of existing response mechanisms on the increase in poverty as a result of lockdowns. 
So I'm gonna take you back over a little bit of the economics of early response and resilience studies. I know those have been floating around for a while, um, but just a refresher on how they worked and then really look at the results when we combine that with the micro simulation estimates. So just a reminder, household economy analysis underpins um, the economics of early response studies. Uh, it's a livelihoods based, based framework. It underpins all of the FuseNet um, work for, for Africa. And it looks at the way people obtain access to the things they need to survive and prosper. So it uses baseline data um, in livelihood zones for different wealth groups, and then looks at different problem specifications. Uh, as well as coping capacities to be able to estimate people's um, livelihoods and the gaps that they experience when sh certain shocks or stresses affect them. And just to give you an idea, typically the HEA model starts with a baseline that estimates um, the, the various types of income that make up a household economy. Um, so in this case, the different color blocks represent the different types of income that might be in a household economy. It compares this against the percentage of minimum food energy needs for a household to survive. It then looks at two different thresholds, a survival threshold and a livelihoods protection threshold, which are estimates of what people would need um, to be able to survive uh, survival at a bare minimum and livelihoods really a more realistic estimate. We can then impose a hazard onto the model to see how each of those different types of income contracts and estimate the deficit that occurs. This is what would need to be filled by humanitarian assistance. And we can then look at um, applying either coping mechanisms and or different types of interventions that might help to expand those total sources of income to then be able to, sorry, my screen just stopped, there we go, to then be able to um, re-estimate the deficit that would occur after we had layered in um, either coping, positive coping me mechanisms and or uh, other types of interventions to help boost household incomes. And this is just an example from one particular agro-pastoral livelihood zone in Somalia. We were able to build these models over 15 years, which is part of why they were so powerful, um, because we could then estimate and look at what a crisis in one year might mean uh, for effects in following years um, to really understand the cyclical nature of protracted crises. Um, the two, the Gu and the Dare for the Gu and the Dare um, harvest seasons, there's two seasons in this region in Somalia. And basically, the, the green line is the, the livelihoods protection threshold. Um, it fluctuates because it depends on market prices and other factors. Uh, and then you can see how we're able to layer in the different types of incomes um, that, that a household might have and how those fluctuate year to year. This is all based on actual data. And as well as make estimates around the stocks and savings. So trying to see how can um, positive uh, effects in one year roll over into the next year or not. And then we can um, apply the, the safety net transfer in this case. So for example, in this um, graph, you can see quite a few years where households have deficits, um, where they are falling behind, below that green line. And then by applying the safety net, we're able to see how much we're able to shift people above that line and offset the amount of humanitarian assistance that would be required. We then took all of this data, which, as I said, was undertaken by Food Economy Group, um, to uh, we use that to estimate the number of people with a deficit, the size of the deficit, and we're able to also use a livestock um, model as well as an income model to estimate how much those would fluctuate year on year in terms of avoided losses for households. And we then combined that into a 15 year economic model where we use data on the cost of response under different scenarios, the cost of different types of programming, other factors such as multiplier effects um, where we were able to use cash transfers to fill needs, et cetera, to then estimate the cost of each scenario, discounting that by 10% to calculate net present value. And the findings from the USAID study, uh, well, I should say DFID and USAID, but the, these are the most recent findings from the 2018 analysis. 
clearly showed that um, there's an, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. Um, we were also able to estimate the blue line is how much we were able to save in terms of humanitarian assistance savings. So these are savings to donors as well as avoided losses to households, uh, which has been really important for articulating why investing in um, safety net and resilience building measures is more cost effective um, than uh, sort of repeated and ongoing humanitarian assistance. And obviously um, the scenarios build on each other. So the baseline was looking at a purely humanitarian late response. We then looked at what the effects would be if we were able to provide an earlier response and then that combined with a safety net and that combined with um, a resilience building measure. And of course, the, the ratios that, that most people use are this benefit to cost ratio of 2.8 to 1 or 3 to 1 um, as a result of being able to invest uh, more proactively. And there is the breakdown of the, the benefits in terms of 32% accruing to um, humanitarian assistance savings, so donor savings uh, and government savings, and then um, the other 68% as uh, avoided losses for households because they're less affected. So we then combined, that's, that's <laughs> the economics of early response in a nutshell, um, we then combined those findings with micro simulations for the COVID-19 impact in Ethiopia. So as I said, Emily Wilde was responsible for doing all of this work, and it was a lot of work to try and estimate um, how much the number of people in need of assistance was increasing uh, with the effects of COVID-19. So the micro simulations use detailed household surveys combined with the World Bank high frequency survey, survey data on the impacts of COVID-19 to estimate poverty levels. And then we, we, Emily, combined that with actual coverage to also estimate gaps in provision. provision. So the estimates include the level and distribution of the number of people in need both before and after COVID-19 induced recessions the nature and distribution of existing cash transfer and food assistance, as well as um, a safety net provision um, to see how much we were, were missing, and then the estimated gaps in provision. So, so how many who and where um, were not getting the assistance they needed. The findings, um, this is just a quick snapshot. Uh, you can see that the findings were broken down by urban and rural populations. On the right-hand side, you've got the total number of people who are poor on the blue line, uh, sitting below the poverty line. Um, and then the number of people, in this case, covered by social protection, we also added in uh, humanitarian assistance, um, both pre-COVID and post-COVID. So you can see a very significant step up in the number of people falling below the poverty line, according to the micro simulations, an increase of 50% from 30 million to 45 million, um, but a nowhere near commensurate increase in the number of people covered by social protection from the standard 8.8 .8 million um, sitting under the safety net to 10.1 million. And I'm not even totally sure actually, and Fergus might be able to enlighten us as to how much that goal has been met um, in the actual response. So we then used this data to look at how we could estimate the economic cost savings um, by comparing three different scenarios. So first we looked at pre-existing caseloads. So we looked at the 8.8 .8 million people who receive support through the PSMP, and then the 3.3 .3 million who receive humanitarian cash and food assistance. We then looked at the second scenario was the post COVID-19 planned expansion. So the plan was to increase caseloads from 12.1 million, which is the 8.8 .8 plus the 3.3, to a total of 14.7 um, million people. And so we were estimating how much could we save by, by rapidly expanding our caseloads through both horizontal, horizontal, well, through horizontal expansion to more people in response to COVID-19. And then the third scenario looks at what if we had actually extended caseloads to cover the full number of people who were estimated um, to be affected by COVID-19 according to the micro simulation. So it's not the full 49, 45 million people because the PSMP currently doesn't cover the full poverty caseload, but we used the same percentage increase in the number of people falling below the poverty line as a result of COVID to estimate how much caseloads should increase by if they were going to be proportional to the need. And here are the findings. So the 
as you can see, um, you know, the, the, the findings really reinforced um, what we had already seen in the economics of early response and resilience studies. Under the first scenario, we estimated that we were able to save approximately $871 million in the first year by having a safety net and humanitarian assistance response in place. So those people receiving assistance um, as, as compared with if we didn't have the PSMP and the humanitarian assistance in place and they had been affected um, and were falling below the poverty line. Under the post COVID-19 planned expansion, we estimated that we would be able to save 1.0, well, $1 billion. Um, so, you know, a fair bit extra on top of the pre-existing case loads um, with a return on investment of $3.2 for every $1 spent. But as I mentioned, whilst these um, expansions were planned, um, it's, you know, at the time of writing, it wasn't totally clear how much they had actually come through. And then when we looked at what if we actually had expanded um, the program, the PSMP and the humanitarian caseload to cover that 18 million people who were estimated to be in need um, proportional to the existing programming, we would have saved 1.2 billion. So again, a significant step up from the 871 million. These are numbers reflecting the resilience scenario. So the early response combined with the safety net combined with the resilience measure. The numbers are not that different. They just fall by a small amount if you look at just the safety net response. Um, so there is a very clear and significant case to be ensuring that our existing systems are able to pivot and horizontally expand when there are increases in need. And then it would have saved us quite a lot of money, both through uh, humanitarian as well as the safety net programming and both from the donor side as well as from the government side. So in terms of the summary of key findings, you know, as I've just mentioned, it's clear that there are substantial cost savings that could be realized both on the part of donors um, and government saving money, as well as avoided losses for households as a result of investing in more proactive responses. And that, that case, as one would expect, but it's obviously very useful to have the numbers behind it, is significantly enhanced um, under, under the COVID-19 crisis and the expansion in caseloads that result, have resulted from that. These savings are realized critically as a result of a timely response. That's really core to the model um, is that we're, we're basically looking at how much could we save both through cost savings as well as through reducing negative coping strategies and mitigating effects on households through a more timely response. And that is going to come through in a minute in the policy implications. And that is also further increased by using a layered approach that combines cash and food transfers with cash plus measures and resilience building activities. So really thinking about these layered approaches is really important in how we do our work. And in terms of policy implications, the three, there are three really big ones. So going back to this idea that this, these findings, these economic gains are predicated on a timely response. In order to achieve a timely response, and, and I'll give a plug as well, I wish the, the, that we had the finalized paper in time for this, but we've also through space been doing an analysis of all of the social protection responses globally um, in COVID and the different factors that drove timeliness. So I think that that will be a really important follow-up piece um, uh, to this. In order to get a timely response, we need to have crisis financing in place that can speed up the time it takes for international and national funding streams to reach beneficiaries. This is really critical. You know, as Greg has said in the past, right now we opt in, we need to have an opt out model where the financing is, place, is in place and that we choose to opt out rather than to opt in so that these systems can work much more effectively. Unlocking funding is the first step, but this funding then needs to be channeled into systems that can effectively and rapidly reach those in need. So shock responsive social protection or adaptive social protection are really, really critical. And we've really seen that in this crisis. How can we have the systems that allow us to rapidly, horizontally and vertically expand the systems that we have in place? 
And finally, investing in networks of local actors is really, really key. One of the things that has really come out in this crisis is that for a whole variety of reasons, local actors have been absolutely foundational and critical. And as we all know, we've fallen significantly short on meeting our goals around uh, investing more directly in, in local capacity and local design and response. Um, they are very consistently the first ones to respond. Uh, with cash assistance, with in-kind assistance, and they play a critical role in delivering these economic gains as kind of the first uh, layer of, of actors um, who are there ahead of, of all of the international streams coming in. So with that, I am going to um, hand over to Stefan, and we can obviously uh, engage in um, I'm sure there's plenty of questions that come up, both technical and otherwise, but we're really keen to ground this evidence base, which has been around for a bit, in a conversation around what does that mean in terms of policy and how can we really use this to move forward and shift the way that we think about what we do. So I'm really excited to have both Stefan and Greg here to offer their thoughts and comments on how this kind of fits into some of the wider agendas that we're seeing. So with that, I will turn over to you, Stefan. Well, thank you so much um, for well, thank you for a very clear presentation. And you know, this is a, this is an important topic, um, but it also is important that we build up the evidence base around it. So, so I'm very grateful for for the kind of work, and and of course, this this work is building on work uh, Courtney has been doing in in uh, earlier as well with others as well. So there's three things, first of all, that I want to emphasize, and then I'm going to also give a bit of further comments of, you know, how can we make this case going forward a bit stronger as well. So the first three things, and this is, if you remember anything of the things I'll say, remember these three, these three things, which is linking back to what, uh, what we ended with. You know, the economic case, for being early and being early in humanitarian responses is really self-evident. You know, endless research on costly coping strategies over decades now shows how, you know, when people have to start beginning to cope, they undermine their future capacity to, um, to recover. They undermine their own ability to, uh, to, to get out of a crisis, even if they can begin to cope a little bit with it, with their coping strategy. So being early when a crisis happens is so important. And the economic case is, is almost a no-brainer. The logic of it is a no-brainer. Now, what is good about studies like this is that they try to at least also put some numbers on it, because there's many things that could significantly change something but we never know what significantly means. What is it? What is the economic size of the of the benefits from it? So going towards a cost benefit analysis, a benefit cost ratio has been presented is just always an important part of it to be able to think about how we do our investments. Of course, a lot of what is being said here is dependent on two further things. And that's also this uh, where, where we ended is uh, was emphasizing that. So the first thing is. You can only you know, respond during crises if you have actually these underlying structures in place. So one of the big things I think we really need to, to, um, to start thinking more about is what can we do coming out of COVID to actually getting the structures on the ground and that's in any kind of settings, you know, whether it's places where there's natural disasters or where people particularly could be affected, maybe at future endemics, but also places where we could worry about conflicts or other kinds of things. Can we get the backbone of the systems in place now so that we have a basis of, 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 of responding? And I'm, I'm very struck by, by what, uh, what is shown here. And of course, I'm uh, always fascinating and interested in, in work that also tries to think about this in Ethiopia. I remember being around in 2015 during the, uh, the, the big drought there, and it was clear from day one that just the fact that the backbone was there with the PSNP was going to make the whole response so fundamentally different from a typical big large-scale drought of the scale that we have there. So it's just important, and in fact, 
there is some good research evidence now about the 2015 drought as well, that the presence of the PSMP meant that you know, the, the, the response was actually remarkably effective. You know, very little evidence in the data that mortality really increased in the end, despite all the big worries that, that people had. And put it slightly differently, you know, not everyone was covered, of course, by the PSMP, but it actually allowed humanitarian organizations, international agencies to focus on those who were not quite covered. And of course, it unlinks here to what we're talking about. Let's build these systems in a way that they can be responding and expanding still uh, when crisis comes. And then the final thing uh, on this kind of big, big, uh, the big points here is that, you know, of course, all these systems can only work if we start thinking early on of how finance can be in place to respond quickly where we need to do it. And, you know, in my current role sitting in the FCDO, okay, I'll be very honest, you know, this is a very inefficient way of, of handling whenever there is a crisis endless decisions need to be taken, shall we do certain things or not, you know, if we can't get finance in place beforehand for these systems, we'll never be getting these things to function properly. However, I, so these are, these are the, the core points, you know, the logic is clear, but do cost-benefit analysis, build these structures ex ante, think about the finance, these are the three points. I want to just add very quickly though, how can we make this now stronger? Because this is an evidence base and it's great. You know, why doesn't anyone ju or, or jump on it? You know, the logic is so clear, the numbers come into it. And I want to do an appeal to also get the research side of this work stronger. And let me quickly make a number of points. You know, in the end, these results are only as strong as the method underlying it. Okay, and you know, the food economy analysis, you know, we shouldn't make this into a religion we need to see the details of what's underlying these models. And, and, you know, simulations are simulations. I'm a researcher, you know, the assumptions you build in will contribute to your outcomes. You know, you have to accept that, you have to be willing to be honest about that. So it's one way of getting at the counterfactual, but it's not the best way. It's not, it's one way of getting at what would have happened if we hadn't this in place or if we had this in place, but it's still, you know, you model, it's a reflection of reality. It's maybe based on data, but it's not, it's not the reality that you've been able to describe necessarily. So I would want to appeal here is that, you know, triangulate this further. And, and you know, there is actually an interestingly already a study that uses actual data collection exposed in Ethiopian COVID. Kiram Abe and other people, they've recently published a World Bank a research paper where they can show that based on following up on people had there was a baseline follow-up data using phone service during COVID, that people who were covered by the PSMP, relative to other people that were not covered, the PSMP people had virtually no impact on food security, on their health and education expenditure, which is really striking. It's very consistent to this. And um, paper is being put in the, in, the, in, the, in the chat very helpfully. It's important to bring that evidence in as well because it supports your case in, in a way and the triangulation is important. But it also means that the research underlying here, you know, it needs to be published in a peer review journal so that we can use it and keep on quoting it and not just in advocacy work. The paper as it is written now, cannot be enough on that. So please show your workings as detailed as you can because you need to make it stronger. And it also leads to another point and a final point and I, and I will stop there. You know, within the humanitarian sec sector, we have virtually no rigorous evidence that shows that humanitarian interventions work. You know, in a, in a world where, you know, we have a chief economist at FCDO who keeps on trying to get best buys based on the strongest possible evidence, we have virtually nothing in the humanitarian sector. Now, of course, don't, uh, don't encourage me to set up an RCT in a humanitarian crisis. That's not what we're doing. However, these kind of things we're talking about, they can be evaluated much more stronger. And they can be built much more stronger than, than we can. You know, and allow me to do a very quick plug is some work we've been involved in still with my researcher hat is on a study of an early response to flooding in Bangladesh. 
based on an anticipatory finance mechanism, where essentially exactly the, the backbone of what Courtney is talking about here, which basically means an, uh, having in place a system that responds in case something happens and then responding when it happens. Now, for all kinds of almost administrative cock-ups, we actually could do a proper counterfactual analysis. People that should have been covered were not covered and they couldn't be reached quickly enough. But we allow, allowed us to do a study and in next few weeks, we'll be able to bring it out from Bangladesh and we can start showing what, it, what the impact is of being in time on consumption and so on. Now, what's interesting here is that actually there is not that much difference on the coping strategy, something that the food economy model puts in there. We actually can't show that. And we have to be welcome to be challenged that the actual evidence may suggest that the mechanisms are a bit different from the ones we think. So anyway, uh, that's a bit of a plug implicitly as well. It's a work uh, based on an WFP intervention, working with OCHA and with the Center for Disaster Protection. But it actually, we need to get much more rigorous evidence of these systems itself in place. So I'm a big fan, but allow us to be challenged also that our evidence base, it's not finished. So, you know, let's quote these studies numbers, but at the same time, keep on thinking carefully, how can we make sure that we also get the proper evaluative research that actually shows that these systems that collectively, I'm definitely a big believer in it, but that we keep on being challenged, whether we actually get them to work and have the kind of impacts that is described in this paper. Thank you. Great, Courtney, uh, great, great presentation. And Stefan, great to see you again. It's uh, It's been a while and it's interesting. We didn't touch base before this, but I'm gonna come back to the end uh, to that point around empirical evidence. We've actually got an incredible opportunity with the panel data being collected through the World Bank uh, in COVID, uh, not only in Ethiopia, but in Malawi and a bunch of other places that are allowing us to look at uh, what explains why uh, some households and communities fared better in the face of this shock event than, than others. So it's an incredibly important uh, point that Stefan's making there. This modeling makes the case about what could be saved, but it's that empirical data that's going to make the case for what was saved, which is that next step, that, that holy grail of, of resilience and uh, prevention. So I'll come back to that at the end, but I do want to at the beginning just um, reflect on the fact that this modeling and some of the empirical evidence we're starting to see around this just reinforce uh, this idea that a portfolio is needed, uh, a portfolio that includes shock responsive safety nets, that includes early humanitarian response, and that includes resilience building activities. And so to my mind, that all put together as a resilience portfolio. It also underscores the fact that strengthening the capacity of communities and countries to, to respond early in its scale uh, has got to be not only part shouldered by the humanitarian side of donor agencies and governments, but as it's a development endeavor. These are long-term institution buildings, and we've got to be thinking about them as development challenges and not simply uh, hoisting them on the shoulders of uh, humanitarian who are already very much stressed, stretch. Courtney's presentation, one of her points at the end was, uh, was around localization. I think we all recognize that COVID-19 has really shown a light on the, uh, the essential role of local actors and local systems. And so beyond any preventative uh, benefit of, of having these systems in place, there's simply a operational cost savings of having an architecture in place, in places where we're responding to shocks and stresses, uh, if not every year, every three to five years. I also think something important here uh, as a programmatic takeaway is this essential notion that uh, there are uh, risks that go beyond the capacity of households and communities to manage on their own. And it doesn't matter whether it's Ethiopia or California, there's going to be shock events that overwhelm the capacity of, uh, of households and communities to manage on their own. So these systems that Stefan really underscored, putting that architecture in place is essential and they aren't temporary. It's a permanent architecture and that's really, really important. I think it goes beyond safety nets. I think we need to be thinking about uh, uh, resilient market systems, resilient health systems. I just saw something posted in the chat around that. So this essential notion that we can't just be thinking about households and communities, we really need to think about strengthening systems and not systems just in good time, but how they react in the moment of a shock event. And, and, and uh, the point that was made several times, where's the financing to allow them to react in the moment of a shock event? I also think an important thing underscored by this analysis is, on the livelihood side, is this combination of shock responsive safety net, 
market systems interventions, but also this middle, uh, middle piece around economic inclusion, reaching down to uh, build the capacity of people and households to take advantage of market opportunity. And so I think as we look at the huge numbers of people who have been pushed back into poverty or chronic hunger, that economic uh, inclusion piece is really, really important in terms of, as a complement to shock responsive safety nets, to enable people to move off of social assistance. And so that's, it's something I was clearly in my mind, uh, even before COVID-19 was the importance of economic inclusion. But I think uh, this uh, modeling, where we talk about uh, resilience building activities, I think economic inclusion is an, an essential piece of that resilience portfolio. And I would highlight for you um, the 2021 Economic Inclusion Report uh, uh, from the World Bank as an essential, essential reading uh, to get up to speed on that, because I think it's it really going forward is going to be an essential complement both to these safety net uh, investments, but also to market systems interventions. And on that same uh, note, uh, economic inclusion programs alone won't do it. We need the market systems intervention to create economic opportunities for those who are being supported through economic inclusion. So the central point there is think about this as a portfolio. There's no single activity here. There's got to be a layered portfolio. And I remember years ago, there was this sort of um, uh, very strange argument that somehow we should be thinking about social uh, uh, safety nets uh, or graduation and economic inclusion. And it's got to be and, it can't be or. And we've seen some great examples of that even in Ethiopia, some of the programs that we've supported uh, a program called GRAD in the Ethiopia Highlands was layered on top of a productive safety net program and actually enabled households uh, to increase incomes by about $363 on average uh, and sustainably graduate from the, <clears throat> from the safety net program uh, and really provide a model for government uh, to scale up that, that type of activity. And CARE, will, CARE uh, was the implementer of that activity and they'll have more details, but I hear they've got some recent Ex post study findings that, uh, uh, that that show that these impacts actually were sustained well beyond the end of the end of the program. Then the the final point I would make, and it was the one I was linking to Stefan earlier on, is these uh, modeling out the benefits of averted losses and spending are incredibly powerful. They are the ounce of prevention, pound of cure argument, and it's wonderful to be able to put numbers. But now some of the the measurement we're do doing, particularly around measuring averted humanitarian need is even more powerful because it is empirical. It's data collected in the moment. It's shock triggered data collection, just like the World Bank's doing with these phone surveys, following the same households through time to see how hard they're hit and how quickly they recover, to try and understand why some households and communities fare better uh, in the face of shock events than others. So there's an incredible opportunity uh, to build out the notion uh, put forward in this modeling with empirical evidence. And that really is, we're there, we're at that moment where uh, we need the, the, the data to complement the modeling. The modeling was incredibly important early on and continues to be and sort of making the case and putting the big global numbers on, but now we need specific instances about these investments were made and here's the return in terms of, uh, of course, avoided losses, because this is essential for households not uh, entering into a downward spiral, but also um, that averted humanitarian need, which really speaks uh, in my case, uh, to, to the folks on Capitol Hill who make funding decisions about what gets funded and whatnot. Nothing more powerful than that graph. We had one in 2016 in Southern Ethiopia that showed households and communities we reached uh, had a minor decline in their food security versus households and communities uh, that, that hadn't been reached by our programs uh, that experienced a 30% uh, decline in their food security. So that kind of data, real data is gonna be incredibly, incredibly important. So. Um, I, I think we'll see more and more actually over the coming months, uh, uh, empirical evidence out of this, um, the World Bank uh, phone surveys, that's gonna just reinforce the messages that come out so clearly in this modeling, uh, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, that this isn't just a humanitarian endeavor that we need to bring the development side to the table to really make those investments in resilience, in economic inclusion, uh, in building up the systems and institutions to respond uh, and really focus on building up local institutions. They're cheaper uh, operationally, uh, they're on the ground uh, when uh, external actors can't be. And I think that's got to be an essential piece of, uh, of the response going forward. And I do think as tough as this year has been, as uh, horrific as the impacts are on poverty, hunger, and malnutrition, 
there's an incredible opportunity to build out of this with data uh, and really rethink how we equip communities and countries to, to, to fare in the face of future shocks and, shocks and stresses, which of course uh, highlighted amongst those is the climate crisis and the need to really equip, as Stefan said, uh, the institutional architecture on the ground to adapt and manage uh, uh, in the face of what's coming. All right, uh, that's it for me this morning. Fergus, can I be really cheeky and just quickly jump in? Um, just with <laughs> use my presenters um, uh, plus. So just to quickly say that I so appreciate both Greg and Stefan's points. They're absolutely spot on. And I think just to highlight that the reason why we um, undertook the modeling effort is because part of what we really struggled to um, identify through empirical studies was kind of that rolling effect. So being able to look at 15 years of historic data and to understand how previous years affected upcoming years was not, I mean, to do that empirically would, would have been a really large exercise and a long exercise. And we, one of the things that we did was to compare the findings in this study with the World Bank study that Stefan was referring to and that I think Valentina kindly put a link to in the chat. Um, and it was really exciting to see that they were actually very strongly corroborating each other, the findings from the model and the findings from that empirical evidence. So there, both Greg and Stefan's comments are absolutely spot on in terms of how can we use what we're seeing um, from the modeling to then also corroborate that with what we actually see empirically. The one other thing that I wanted to say to just to give Greg and Stefan's work a bit of a plug as well is that I think we're also starting to understand more empirically about what actually allows people to realize some of these gains. And one of the studies that I lean into a lot that um, Greg's team at the Center for Resilience back in the day did was looking at how social capacities fundamentally affect whether or not we're able to cope with our shock or our stress. And then Stefan with his work at the Mind and Behavior Institute um, at, at Oxford, uh, looking at how people's mental models in Ethiopia fundamentally affect poverty reducing outcomes. So I think also there's a need to understand empirically more beyond what drives those resilience outcomes beyond what we already sort of do as our bread and butter. And then lastly, at some point we'll go, I'll let Fergus take us over to the questions, but I'm just gonna add in my question to Greg and Stefan, I would love to hear a little bit more too about like where, you know, we've got a new administration in the US, not to put you guys on the spot, but also, and also um, leadership of the G7 and the COP in the UK. Where are you seeing entry points for some of, of this work, for some of these lessons, where the struggles and the battles, just kind of that bigger picture would also be super interesting to, to hear from you um, as we go through the questions. Um, but with that, Fergus, I will stop taking up more time and turn over to you to moderate. Thanks very much, Courtney. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that uh, the Slido link uh, is in the chat um, bar and, and you can post or like uh, questions in there. Um, uh, if I can um, uh, drop on Courtney's question to Stefan and, and Greg, uh, there, there is a question um, around um, what are the aspects that are holding us back and um, what are those opportunities? Um, obviously, uh, change in administration, um, provides a different context in, in which these these sorts of findings can exist but also the UK is uh, G7 uh, president and um, and also COP president designate um, uh, it offers opportunities and with adaptation uh, becoming such a strong focus of, of this these particular climate talks um, how can we use these findings uh, to to sort of uh, change how the way we do uh, emergency response with the way we manage risk um, in these contexts. Um, and, and if I can um, highlight uh, the sort of differentiated approaches that might be necessary based on conflict and, 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 um, and in nat natural disaster type situations as well. Uh, so I don't know who wants to jump in first, but uh, over to you, Gregor Stefan. Over. I'm happy to start and then maybe Stefan can take it up. Um, I think what's been really great so far in the lead up 
to the G7 to COP is how central disaster risk financing is to the discussion. Uh, and it's, it's really, really uh, within the context of USAID, it is uh, our Bureau, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, that's really engaged from a development perspective on uh, disaster risk financing. And I think there's more energy and enthusiasm and weight behind it than there's ever been, at least in my time, my 10 years at USAID. So I think that's really, really great and a tremendous opportunity. I also think there's this moment where everything's coming together. You know, there was like resilience to recurrent crisis work and then broader work on climate adaptation and now COVID. And it's now this, this triple threat of a climate crisis, COVID-19 and conflict is really coming together as the central problem set that we're confronting. And I think within the context of a reorganized USAID, we're structurally well-equipped uh, to respond in different ways, particularly uh, my Bureau, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, working with the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and the Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization in this construct we call Relief, Recovery, recovery and Resilience, these three, uh, this family of bureaus. So I think we're structurally well-equipped and then we've got uh, incredible new leadership who is taking, uh, with the seriousness required, the, the climate crisis and our need to go all, all hands on deck uh, in responding to that and not approaching it as a simple sectoral problem or a separate earmark, but really saying, how does the totality of development deal with this intersect of, of COVID and climate and all these challenges? So. Um, yeah, I, I think that we're in a very different time than we were uh, prior to November in terms of um, uh, particularly around climate change, but not exclusively. And I think that um, some of the, as I think back years ago, uh, some of the, the way we were organized, we weren't really fit for purpose. So I, I feel like we're much more fit for purpose. And I've been really encouraged by um, the discussions, not only within USA, but with other donors about the, the centrality of disaster risk finance. Um, which hasn't always been there. I mean, I, I think the enthusiasm around adaptation too, and the recognition that um, uh, uh, climate financing is really focused on mitigation and, and a real push now to not only get public financing for adaptation, but also try and get private sector financing for adaptation. And so there's a lot of ambition right now in the US and uh, we're excited to support the new administration. So let, yeah, let, me, let me pick this up is that, um, well, in the UK, let's say the situation is maybe slightly a bit more confusing. You know, we, we seem to have taken on quite a lot of things with reforms and, and uh, mergers and budget cuts and so on. But besides that, you know, the G7 and uh, the COP is an enormous opportunity. And, and definitely from where I'm sitting, you know, I don't, I, 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 I cannot recall ever uh, a more opportune opportune moment than now to start pushing some of these agendas because you know there is a fundamentally also with our political leaders a deep understanding that resilience matters i mean the word is being used all the time now and whether it's about supply chains or in the way we organize our work it is there for the from seeing from the uk having the presidency of the g7 and of cop 26 uh this year it is clear that it's that it's there, and you know, even though maybe our budgetary situation is a bit challenging, issues to do with disaster risk finance and related issues are are really coming to the fore. Um, it's an interesting thing is that um, what Greg is saying as well is that you know I I was I was chairing early on one of the working groups on the G seven, and I do remember when. Uh, we all said goodbye and, and I left. I remember shouting in the room, the US is back. Uh, and which is just that actually uh, this general feeling that we also have is that indeed they are back in all these agendas where we knew they were there and it was just very hard. And it makes it so much easier generally globally for us to also be continue to do this because I don't think there's enough people from all different and now FCDO on the line. You know, these agendas have been alive with us as well, but it was actually really hard to push it uh, without actually having the, the joint or the combined leadership uh, also with, with the US there, you know, and, 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 and from Germany as well, if I just may name them in there. Greg made another really important point, is that this goes beyond 
animated earlier beyond just social protection systems. So where is it actually just this opportune moment is that, you know, if, if our political leaders talk about resilience in supply chains, we can also talk to them about resilience of health systems, resilience of education systems, and indeed, and, and that's also why, of course, this moment with COVID is just so important, is that we can actually get um, the, we can actually uh, push this further. So yeah, so there's the thing. Can I just pick up on one small thing, and I saw it in actually in one of the questions already, is, you know, it's an interesting thing also looking at, say, a country, what has changed over in this whole period, you know, relative to 2030 in Ethiopia. I mean, I refer to it already. When I was in 2015 in Ethiopia, I could see already this was different from then the data that, that you were working on, on the, that you used in 2013. There was already a much better response. And I remember one of the most, my, my best moments was actually the Ethiopian government being really cross at the UN people by saying, look, this is not anymore 2002 or three when you last were dealing with a massive drought here. You know, we have the PSNP, just trust us that these, the PSNP will work well. And indeed the evidence later on, you know, there's a good paper by Kale Hirvan and others documenting that actually 2015, the PSNP worked really well in the drought period. So things are changing. And of course, complexity of Ethiopia today, let's not go into that now. But in many countries, there is an evolution there as well, and we're getting there. But this is the moment to push it further. And let me stop uh, with here. Thanks very much, uh, Greg and Stefan. Um, so can I, uh, I've got a, a, a question for you, uh, Courtney, on uh, in particular on gender. Um, and the, the analysis that you showed was was um, compelling uh, at, the, at the high level, but um, I wondered if there was any uh, ability to, to disaggregate that further and to better understand what the impact uh, for women and girls, men and boys, uh, would be. Over. Yeah, 100%. It's an absolutely spot on question. And unfortunately, it's, we weren't, we didn't have either, we didn't have the data, um, or we weren't able to disaggregate. Uh, and that was, you know, something that we would have, I know Emily wanted to do with the micro simulations as well was to really try to unpack that, particularly because um, you know, we already know that protracted crises have a bigger impact on um, women and girls in many ways, but we also under, you know, the COVID because of its specific characteristics had particular impacts on gender because of the care economy um, and, and the particular nature of the lockdowns as well. So there's, there's a really bit, that's a big gap for sure. And you're right to call it out. Um, I think also that thinking about gender impacts and how what the kind of response scenarios that we modeled looks like is really important, both in terms of how you target transfers, but also from the resilience building perspective. And I think this also feeds into some of the research that I was just mentioning that Greg and Stefan have also um, been helping to lead on around really understanding why and how women's empowerment, their social networks, their agency, their self-efficacy, when you think about the model that we built, we were looking at fairly generic returns. I mean, they were from robust evidence, but returns on investment to different types of interventions. But we know that those returns will be mediated depending on who those investments are targeting and how they're being targeted. And, and importantly, the social characteristics that sit within that that allow and create the space for women to also thrive within their communities could very significantly leverage the gains that we predicted in the model. So I, it's it's front and mind, front and center in my mind, just because of my all of my other work. Um, but sadly, yeah, no, we did it, it would be great to be able to try to unpick that further for sure. Could I jump in there, Fergus? I actually moderated a panel. This is probably a horrific forum to post a, a link to <laughs> another panel. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually looking at this very issue again with the World Bank data. And so it's a, it is a really important point that uh, we need to get granular on the gender issue. And it's one of the reasons just linking back to a point Courtney made earlier about these sources of resilience that transcend sectors, uh, social capital, women's empowerment, agency and confidence to adapt. The evidence is clear that those things are incredibly important for resilience and predict why some households and communities fare better than others. 
And that's why I highlight, in part why I highlight that, that work on economic inclusion, because it's one of the only sets of programmatic activities that explicitly seek to strengthen social capital, to build confidence and agency. And so if we know this stuff matters, we've got to be thinking, translating it into programmatic and policy action. And I think economic inclusion uh, really is the, the clearest articulation of programming that, that addresses that. Great. This is this is proving to be a, quite a, a useful uh, talk for various different links to other things. Um, I think um, drawing upon your your points, uh, Greg and Stefan, uh, around opportunistic moments in, in time. I think it's, it's also, uh, I guess we should reflect on what's happened till now. So the first bit of this analysis uh, of this type of research, uh, although it dates back a long, 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 long time, um, was in 2013, at least in the in the Horn. Um, and I, I'd be interested in your views on um, what's progressed since then, what hasn't, uh, why that might be the case. Um, was it politics? Was it finance? Was it uh, different moving parts? But um, just, to, just to get a sense of um, what are the things we need to be aware of, um, coming up to the G7 and, and COP and how we can uh, make the most of those those moments. Over. Do you want me to start? Um, so I will reflect that these studies uh, were essential uh, in making the case early on. I mean, I think Stefan's right, like it's intuitive, an ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of cure. Of course, if we if we put preventative action, we'd be able to reduce the response, but without being able to quantify it early on, there was always the argument that, look, our humanitarian um, dollars are stretched super thin. We can't pre-commit to a place when we don't know where the, the next disaster is going to be. So it really was essential for shifting the idea that people in places that are subject to recurrent crisis, they're not, it's not a humanitarian problem, it's actually a development problem. And to start thinking about these people in places developmentally and to start making long-term investments uh, in these places. So within the context of USAID, these studies have pushed that resilience agenda significantly forward, not in isolation. There's also uh, a lot of impact evaluations and other things we've done uh, to build an, an, an evidence base that remains nascent. Like let's, as Stefan made the point, let's be clear, we're still early days and really understanding what is the combination of interventions that really um, get people to a, a more resilient place in the face of shocks and stresses? But I think we've been building, building, building. And I was um, actually based in Nairobi during the 2010-2011 drought when the USAID and others really began to take this at a, more seriously at a different scale than, than had prior previously been the case. And every time I think resilience reached its lo logical plateau, some, something would happen and it would be pushed further into the development dialogue. And now uh, in the wake of uh, COVID-19, the ultimate global use case for the concept of resilience, um, I think it is uh, the concept of resilience, uh, dollars put, being put against it uh, are sort of solidified in the development domain. And uh, Stefan said it, uh, you know, people are leaders are talking about it as part of uh, daily conversations. And so my, I, I think that's all wonderful, but my, my one worry, the whole, the whole long trip we've been on over the last decade is we're in great danger of this becoming a grand relabeling exercise where we simply slap the term resilience onto whatever we're doing and call it good. And so there really is this empirical evidence um, uh, evaluation that really holds us to the concept of resilience. What happens in the moment of that shock event to people's well-being? How hard a hit do they take? How quickly do they recover? And, and so measurement uh, actually plays an outsized role in managing the rise of resilience in the context of international development. So, so if I if I could add, you know, what, what holds these these studies back, you know, what has changed in, in general? I mean, it, it is it is it remains politically always very attractive to, to act exposed. It's just so hard to, in, in any walk of life of any issue, 
to really build up these do these preparedness investments because this is investments you do and if all goes well nobody ever notices it and nothing ever and, and maybe even nothing will ever happen so we we've known that with with, with climate issues we know that in our own countries it's it's the, the evidence is actually very strong so what has changed is that is this conversation around it and actually you know pointing out some of that you know that that uh explicitly that it's some something that needs to be overcome that it's that actually there is this 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 likely higher returns to all this another thing that has changed you know if i think back at the time i was the chief economist and there was this work and you know i i was writing things and and this book that i wrote on stuff like that we one of the things that was very striking is that you get a lot of pushback initially uh from saying yes, that's fine, but it won't work there, or it's only a small problem, or it's not so important, and, and trying to minimize it, which is on one level right, but actually it's not necessarily the point, you know, because problems you solve often by breaking them down and getting the bits and pieces in, in place. And, and I have found that, and Greg made that point earlier, by having more people from the development space talking about it as well to the humanitarians say look this is actually we saying some somehow work together with this is not about you not being able to do certain things because suddenly all this money needs to go in building up these systems long time in advance but we can actually work together and get these resilient systems built up and prepared actually made it a much better conversation now I'm not going to well, I could put grand words like grand bargains and so on in, in my mouth but i don't mean it like that it's more you know there is a better conversation and it's and it and it has helped to break down a bit of silos the fact that even within fcdo social protection and humanitarian gets now used often and these teams are often now talking much more close together where i think 10 years ago or five years ago this would have been very separate type of discussions often so there is some 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 progress there you know i can't help but picking up very quickly here also on, on some kind of reaction saying countries like ethiopia one of the problems we still have with some some of these things here is that exposed governments know that money will come will they get ex ante the money to build all these things up and i do remember and it and it's from some few years ago but like three years ago uh then ethiopia minister of finance telling me i love it and i would like to make the psmp far more shock responsive and put more money aside to do this and so on but if I do that and I have to use my IDA loan for it or something, if I just wait until the crisis comes, the UN will do an appeal and I'll get the money for free. And so the incentives are not really necessarily in favor of these structures either. And we shouldn't just not underestimate it. We make the world very complicated with our aid structures. So we'll, we'll, we'll need to think carefully about it. How can we get the incentives right that these things can actually flourish and work better? I would also just add one piece around when, which is sort of building off of what both Greg and Stefan have said, but in a slightly different direction is uh, when we did the 2018 study, we had a unique opportunity with the Ethiopia data set where we were able to compare baselines that were 10 years apart. And what we saw was that um, people's, I'm gonna, I have to see if I can remember this exactly right, but basically people's, um, livelihoods hadn't changed in the way that we would expect despite investment going in and and we were able to use the analysis i just thought of it because of stefan's um dull disasters and sort of the disaster that never happened we were able to use the data to estimate basically what had happened was that despite a whole bunch of increase in productive potential in agriculture in the particular area, people's, uh, the population growth had been so significant that people's land holdings had decreased by 50%. And so there was a masking in the data of actually people were better off because if we hadn't invested in increasing the productive potential of the land, we would have had a greater humanitarian crisis. But of course you couldn't see that. It was the disaster that didn't happen, which also speaks to this like, political economy palatability piece around how do we get people interested in making this happen because there's not it's not sexy to say oh well we prevented the you know people's land holdings decreasing from an inverted a humanitarian crisis so 
I think really getting into some of the nuance around the data and how we can use um, some of the empirical evidence to be able to show where we also are averting crises is, is key. I would just add there that, I mean, and then translating that into dollars saved, actual dollars saved. And, and like, I'll be frank, like all the indicators we measure, that's the one that speaks to uh, Congress. It's the one that speaks to the American public. I mean, it, you know, it, it's not to say that the cost in terms of lost lives and livelihoods, the cost to national regional economies don't matter. They fundamentally matter. Uh, but understanding your audience, one of our audiences really is honed in on that uh, averted humanitarian assistance need. So we're we're experimenting with some methods to get that. But that is that is the holy grail uh, for for measurement in this. And if we can show, like, not just modeling shows, but you know, we made the case with modeling, but now in in real time, we're showing these these savings occurring. It's it is powerful. I see. It doesn't fully get over the the challenge that Stefan points to is that. Um, in every aspect of our lives, like, you know, whether it's how much we spend on insurance in the case of the US, you know, maybe I take a large deductible because I, I, I'm willing to accept that risk. So, you know, it, it is just a, a fundamental challenge to get people to think about this. But I think the flip for, at least in the context of USA, the big flip over the last 10 years that these studies have helped motivate is to understand that these are fundamentally development challenges and we need to think about them that way. Great, thank you. Um, so ju I just want to pick up on the incentives point, um, both in terms of uh, humanitarian actors, development actors, um, but also governments like, like the Ethiopian government. Um, I think it would be interesting to explore that in a bit further. Um, is there is there a, a is there an offer that can be made that that makes you know, a financial offer um, that makes that that case. The the climate discussion is around adaptation. Fifty percent of climate finance should be focused on adaptation. Is there a way uh, to think about either an instrument that leverages money, or um, such as been done in the past with uh, on vaccines, um, which was very successful in terms of getting Gabby um, enough capsules to predict. Uh, predictably funded vaccines. So is there something in the risk space that could be used uh, in addition to the other instruments that have already existed in, in, in the lights of insurance, et cetera, um, such that we use future money for future crises because we already know what the cost we're gonna incur in the future based on the current system or reactive way of uh, responding based on what Stefan was just saying, the humanitarians go, with um, with the appeal, um, and ironically, we still don't know to this day on the humanitarian side how much preparedness costs. Um, so, what what needs to change in the, in that space? Um, I'll call on Stefan first, maybe this time. Sorry, what needs to change in this space? Um, I mean the. There's, there's a number of, um, I mean, it's, if, if I focus on the thing that I know best, which is like on the financing part and, and the way we can set some of, some of these incentives is that, um, you know, when we design things like the PSMP, um, you know, one of the things that can definitely change is to think uh, much better about well, what would it take to actually make it scalable? And also how we, how we actually un underwrite is better. I mean, the point would be is that with a port doing it one instrument at a time and thinking, oh, how will I now commit pre-commit to the financing of the PSMP when it needs to scale up? We're never going to get onto it. In the end, it becomes about portfolios of actually having a number of these places that you actually on the right. And then you will be able to start showing clearly, look, you know, it's not that I'm now going to divert money that needs to go to crises, but of actually much more being ex ante clear about which of the crises I'm potential crises I on the right. In practice, I'll still put in more or less, or maybe the same or less money by, by better efficiency into this crisis, so at least I can get the money to go further. But I've actually set up a way 
of dealing with it structurally. We'll never be able on the, on the one instrument, like convince the Minister of Finance in Ethiopia to say, uh, buy an insurance or become a member of the ARC simply relative to you can wait for free money. The incentives have to come from the other side and saying, look, collectively we can protect 10 of you your systems by, by in a scalable way. Um, that's that's the only thing it will cost collectively, and then we'll we'll, we'll can do it. So it's it's about about thinking about the underlying structures there as well on the financing. I think that's what's required. But more more can be said about it, and maybe I wasn't too precise. Just add that I mean, in addition to doing things like premium support and co-financing to incentivize countries, I mean, countries are being incentivized by different, um, different costs than we are. So the cost of our humanitarian response is never gonna motivate Ethiopia or, or, or Kenya, but the cost of the national and regional economies is a big motivator. And I recall in Kenya uh, between 2008 and 2011, the $12.1 billion in losses to the economy was a real motivator behind Kenya standing up the Ending Drought Emergencies Initiative. Uh, to invest big dollars uh, in not only systems for shock response, but longer term investments for building uh, community market resilience, et cetera. So I think there are, uh, they, this can be incentivized by looking at what matters most to governments in terms of their, their bottom line. Another real accelerator in the Kenyan case was devolution. The fact that uh, constituents and counties were holding their governors accountable uh, and, and I think that that's really changed the nature of, uh, of engagement in Kenya. But it, this does remain a, a significant, significant issue. And uh, we will always, the U.S. will always be there to respond to humanitarian emergencies. But you're absolutely right. How do we not undermine uh, the preventative action needed? And how do we co-finance it, uh, subsidize it in the near term, but really have a pathway towards this uh, becoming budget line items on, on partner country government uh, budgets. I'm just going to come in one more to actually reinforce something that Greg says. What I found really interesting in 2016, talking to the Ethiopian government about, should we do this? The or 2015, actually, the, the best argument that they were really sensitive to is that what it would do to their investment climate if they had a large scale struggle. And in fact, it was one of the things that made them very reluctant to deal with the UN and actually got them really interested. How can we avoid having to rely on, on that kind of an appeal to do this? And it was really similar to what, what you say on Kenya. It is actually quite, quite an important thing. And just understanding countries' incentives rather than maybe actually prejudging or prejud uh, prejudging what, how they will, will think and so on is, is, then, a, is then a very uh, useful thing to do. But, but I can only keep on repeating, you know, we do it so badly ourselves, you know, it's not that is it's somehow they don't, they are not far sighted, we do it so badly ourselves. So it is a fundamental problem of policymaking. It is about thinking about contingent liabilities and longer term stuff. It brings the, the, the most difficult things together. But, but I think, you know, whatever people think we are making progress in it. And I, I, I'm really pleased with, by the way, you know, the interactions I have with governments in African countries, that they are beginning to see this. And then if we grab this moment, I think we can go, go quite a lot further with all this now. And I'll just add into that a lot of what we've been trying to work through through the space team um, at FCDO, you know, working across 30 different countries is how does this look? And this is partially addresses someone's question about what does this look like in conflict and fragile affected countries? What does it look like when you don't have a government social protection system where we can lean in to really build shock responsiveness and we're starting from scratch? What does it look like when the government isn't necessarily targeting in the ways that are most appropriate or most effective that will actually mitigate these losses? So I think certainly the, the complexity on a country by country basis is not to be underestimated in terms of how you think about the incentives and the structures um, depending on where each country is at. Thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, as, as would be expected, the, the questions are coming in um, uh, quite fast and um, some, of them, uh, some of them being tough ones um, to answer. So um, I think one of the things that, is, um, that I'll, I'll pick up on is uh, everyone's mentioned the sort of portfolio approach um, that's necessary within these, these sorts of environments and how those can be organized. Um, 
there are questions around the functionality of these in, in different responses. So there's some that are um, ones that you would uh, envision government-led systems, and, and then there's others that are, are, are more I think shall, we, shall we impute the question? <laughs> yeah. I, I think I got at least one element of that, that question is that um, there are the formal structures, uh, shock responsive safety nets and, and, and systems that we do need to invest in, but there are also informal, more local structures that are also fundamentally important. And I, I'll point specifically to social capital. And we often don't think about um, as humanitarian actors, as development actors, we don't think about social capital as our domain. In the context of the US, we don't have dollars to build social capital. Uh, and in fact, I would argue uh, many of the things we do actually undermine social capital. So at the very least, we should be aiming not to undermine it, but we also need to think about all the ways in which we interact with communities and groups that actually afford incredible opportunities uh, to build uh, social capital. And I even recall uh, speaking uh, about Ethiopia, we had a very successful um, uh, intervention working with women's milk cooperatives, and it had increased incomes, I don't know, 176 or $196, I don't remember the exact, uh, and everybody celebrated, oh, with big income increases, but when they asked women, what was the most important uh, impact of this intervention on your lives? And they said, you connected me to women I wasn't connected to before. And when times are bad, we lean on each other for support. And when times are good, we pool our resources and we move forward together. And so like it just, those kind of things just change in my mind, the type of, the, the way we need to approach, uh, the way we engage with communities is not as you know technical actors doing just technical work, but actually understand that we're, we're dealing with complex social issues. And we need to be thinking about how we intervene matters just as much as uh, the technical sector in which we're intervening. So I think there really is an importance around local informal structures to dealing with uh, these shock events. And um, we've seen it uh, in the wake of COVID-19 around the world, uh, the role of uh, uh, social capital and the ability to lean on other households. So that was my imputation of uh, Fergus's question. Yeah, sorry, Fergus, we part of it blipped in and out. So we only caught a piece of it. But just to reiterate what Greg said, you know, the, the localization piece is something we've been looking at quite heavily through space because um, we've seen, you know, it's not just about um, people, you know, international staff being pulled out and having less connections to the ground. It, it's so much more fundamental than that around accountability and sensitization and identifying vulnerable households that are missing out on assistance. Um, GBV risks, so many issues that can only be handled through local networks. And certainly to my mind, um, one of the biggest gaps that we fundamentally missed in the way, you know, Stefan's highlighted already several times that we get it mostly wrong anyway, but one of the biggest gaps from my perspective is um, really understanding and investing in the power and capacity of local networks from an empowerment perspective, from a social capacities perspective, but also because they are absolutely fundamental to everything that we do. And our lack of movement in that space is undermining our ability to, to deliver um, effectively. So I would just add that to Greg's. Well, you know, very, very briefly, I think you got an awful lot right as well, Rodney, that, uh, that's not all. <laughs> yes, sorry, I'm not being totally negative. <laughs> But what's interesting here as well, and I think I mean I think this 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 the localization agenda as you as you correctly call it and 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 the local social capitals, for me it's also quite an interesting thing. We sometimes where we are sitting, we think of all these systems of being very centralized, government run, and actually you know even I mean even if we think of PSNP, actually one of its strengths is that actually. At a bit, at a, at a very, quite a local level targeting is organized and we always find that it's done quite well and it actually it is but it's very localized as well in some sense now of course that's still a formal structure i think one of the evolutions that we should think of more uh, of thinking about is so how do we connect 
all these kind of local initiatives properly so that we can actually rather than crowd them out whenever we try to build systems to actually build on top of them you know that we actually build build uh, build systems that are using the strength of local organizations rather than trying to build on top of them and then of overcome them so there's quite a lot of other research i think can used to bits of these as well to 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 to, to show this that that actually there are these opportunities and um it's another conversation but i think it is it's an essential part and it always comes back to ownerships all these targeted systems work well only when they are also locally owned you know if someone someone at the top starts targeting it always tends, tends to go totally wrong now of course there's capture issues as well we want to be careful with but there needs to be that kind of the feedback mechanism the accountability mechanism from the ground otherwise these things will never work properly Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that. And so um, on that point, and given um, all three of you had such extensive experience um, in, in Ethiopia, um, what, what do you think are some of the systemic uh, uh, policy changes that we should be pushing for here locally within, uh, within the British Embassy um, and, and focusing uh, and helping to expand uh, PSMP um, to be bigger and better? Greg, would you like to go first? Sure. I always point to Ethiopia and Kenya probably too much. I need to expand my <laughs> reference. Uh, and then the Sahel as well. But I, the reason I do is because I think they're a little further along the way in this journey. Although, you know, with what's going on in Ethiopia now, that's a, a separate issue. But it's, of course, confounding some of the good progress we've made uh, in Tigray. But that notion that um, it's not just about the Productive Safety Net Program the livelihoods component, the economic inclusion component stacked on top of that is so fundamentally important for providing uh, a means for some, many perhaps people to move off of social, assist uh, social assistance in a resilient way. And so um, that expanding that livelihoods component and then complementing it with market systems interventions that's expanding economic opportunity. So that, li that three-piece livelihood piece is incredibly important. One of the other innovations uh, that our team in Ethiopia had also done uh, is to layer in community-based health insurance uh, on top of that, recognizing that it wasn't just the big shock events uh, around droughts that were impacting people's uh, well-being and causing them to backslide uh, into poverty and hunger, but it was the everyday shocks of people getting sick and the economic impact of that. So I think thinking about what is the portfolio of investments that layer in on top of the PSMP and expanding that uh, becomes in, incredibly, in, incredibly important. And then we've get, got these emergent models uh, that we can then replicate elsewhere. And so um, I do think, um, uh, to Stefan's point, we've got to have a vision uh, for uh, a rebalancing of how much the government of Ethiopia takes on in terms of the expense of the, uh, the PSMP. I think we can get creative with expanding disaster risk financing, et cetera. But this can't be a permanent carry by, um, and I, I don't have the latest data on, on, on how much the government of Ethiopia is covering beyond its uh, contribution in kind, uh, but I know there's been some progress, but I think you know it's very hard for us as um, USA to think about replicating Ethiopia and other countries because of the, it's just so expensive in terms of the dollars we're putting into the PSMP. So I think some roadmap uh, to, to, to sort of, uh, get the government covering more of the, the expenses it can be really important as well it, it, i'm so tempted now since we haven't disagreed on anything can i now disagree a little bit with craig this is like uh, <laughs> otherwise there's no entertainment on this on this seminar either but but it but there is an element and maybe it's not a contradiction because you you came towards the end to a point where what i strongly believe in is that we need to make sure so I'm very worried in Ethiopia that both towards the, what the government has done over the years. I mean, it's some of the, around the PSMP has, of course, been many ways really brilliant. It's also made it very complicated for itself. And, you know, the layering on top of it, it makes it actually increasingly hard for it to handle it. So I actually would actually probably think slightly differently in the first instance about it and try to find ways of simplifying it to make sure that the backbone is there and robust and resilient and can work. And then, yes, indeed, invite other things that can go on top of it. But maybe one of the things that has gone 
bit wrong, in, I mean, many things are going wrong in Ethiopia, we know, but one thing that has gone wrong probably is an overstretching of the state capability that, that the government is trying to do too much. And, and technically in Addis Ababa, they have great ideas, but then actually making it really complicated and, and it becomes a bit too much. And I think we reach this point where actually going to the, the bare bones of it, the, the backbone of the system, making sure that it's robust, that it can finance it itself, that it has a better structure of doing that, probably would be better than encouraging them to layer it. That would be my thing, but it doesn't have to contradict. As long as we make that backbone resilient so that it can be broad enough, because I worry that we'll overstretch it at some point, it will be so unmanageable, we'll see more things not working well, and in the end, the essence will also start getting lost. That's probably one thing. Having said this also, there's a nice link with what Fergus was asking earlier, and what Greg now just said. For example, on things like, um, you know, like the health insurance and the health components. One thing we shouldn't forget on Ethiopia is that it has remarkable uh, insurance-based social capital. You know, I've worked as a researcher often on the funeral societies, the Uders in Ethiopia. You know, they do provide health insurance. And even it's been a few years ago, but since we did, it's amazing what these communities actually try to do in insurance thing. Of course, this is one of the most shock vulnerable countries in the world in all respects. And so it's not surprising that they did this. So it's again, the more we can build on what they do rather than trying to impose an outside model is actually going to be really good. And again, not encouraging the government and say, we'll build up now a whole system to do it. You know, maybe, and, and comes back to this point, let's, let's get the government knowing, doing better, the underlying things it really needs to do well, and not trying to make, encourage it to take on more and more because I think it's, it's, it's reaching that limit uh, in it. And, Maybe in that respect, the politics has changed a bit as well on the development of state. So let's not expect them to do certain things that intuitively would be going against their, 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 their own instincts. Anyway, that's just a comment. Nothing yeah, from my side. Answer, I'm going to leave it. <laughs> I've uh, done a horrible job of uh, and just continuing to ask questions because I'm interested in the subject. But um, I'm going to quickly, very quickly sum up. Um, uh, a, we've got immense opportunity. B, we need to take a portfolio approach. Um, and C, we need to take an, an empirical and evidence-driven uh, approach to, to all of this uh, and consistently thinking about incentives um, through all of this. Um, I apologize for running a minute over, um, but that, that's the, the sort of three takeaway points to draw upon Stefan's three points to make. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining this session. Um, it's been immensely interesting and, uh, and I hope we can do more like it. Thanks to all the panel members as well and Courtney for your research. Thank no you. Worries. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. And, and Stefan, not a contradiction at all. I don't think we need to heap this onto the PSMP. I think we need other actors, private sector and others to get involved. So have a great day, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Bye now.